So I made some recent adjustments. I did a talk at uh, RSA Europe, and I really liked how personal it was. And when I thought about it, uh, Rugged was really originally an attempt to add cultural and incentive and people process benefit to the existing technology solutions from communities like OWASP. So I'm not sure my timing, but I'm going to do my best to motor through some of it uh, to paint some context. Um, also, we're going to try to build on some of the concepts you saw in uh, Gene Kim's keynote this morning, uh, which he and I have been working on for about a, a year and a half. Um, so he, as he said, I'm director of security intelligence, but you know my, my background really goes back to being um, a philosophy undergrad. I got into software development for five years in a QA organization for a network company. Uh, I started doing custom malware and espionage stuff in 2001. So I've always looked at like the, the harder security problems, not simple things like viral and antivirus. And then I, uh, after doing a lot of strategy work for things like ISS and IBM, I became uh, an industry analyst for a couple of years because I didn't want to be wedded to an individual vendor or vendor interest. I really wanted to look at what are the big challenges of the security industry, and it gave me that opportunity to do so. So here are a couple of things that I think uh, keep us stuck as an industry and how we might get unstuck. So I'm not going to be as personal as I was, but I've had some uh, life challenging and foundational challenging uh, events in the last month or two. So it's making me a little bit more honest and earnest than I normally am, so I apologize. Um, but you know, I think about the value set that makes me interested in security. If I could be a superhero, if I had the physique, I would, but I don't. So I'm going to be a geek instead, and I try to be you know, principled. The, the, this particular phrase came from a Navy SEAL uh, in Dallas, Fort Worth, who uh, we did some cross training with. We taught him some cybersecurity, and he taught us some Krav Maga and weapons training. Uh, but he says he wants to be a passionate, uh, pr purposeful, principled protector and provider. And the last little tagline is he wants to be the kind of man his daughters would want to marry. And I try to bring that to what I do. I know some people see this as a good puzzle. I know some people see this industry as a good way to make money. Um, but there's a, there's a higher purpose to some of this stuff, and I don't think we fully realize it as a community. So, you know, my mother almost uh, died recently. Uh, she's had a pretty bad stroke. And, you know, you think about what, how do you want to be remembered. So if I had three words, this is my aspirational, I try to be as honest as I can be. I try to take on uh, dangerous issues that are important. And I try to have an impact. Mostly people think I'm an unreasonable fool. Uh, that's an Easter egg if you understand those two quotes. But, um, you know, I'm trying. So the question I asked in, at RSA London, just to prime why I think rugged cultures matter, um, is are we getting better as a security industry? So don't take this too personally as an OWASP uh, community, but are we getting better in security? And the simple answer is no. I'm, I'm not going to equivocate. We're not. Now, maybe we're getting better in certain areas. We're getting worse faster than we're getting better. Um, so the U2 song, if you recognize it, is it getting better or do you feel the same, right? I mean, do you feel like we're making progress? You know, are you feeling like we're just knocking those OWASP top 10 off the list? Um, do you feel like the breaches are going down, that there's fewer adversaries, that IT is stabilizing, not changing? Um, to continue the lyric, um, often we just blame somebody, right? We blame the kitten killing Chinese, right? The APT threat. We, we blame uh, Anonymous is the new one, right? Uh, what's next? We're going to blame Canada. Um, so we, we just don't. We don't really take responsibility for what we could be doing to advance ourselves. So I asked this every six months of the Digerati in the echo chamber. I said, are we getting better, worse, or staying the same? And, and how would you know? And you get, if you ask 10 of them, you'll get 12 answers. Um, so you know, a long, long time ago, I'm not going to marshal us through this, but um, I actually think I blogged about this once. But these are the sources that drive up our cost, complexity, and risk, right? And if you ask yourself against each of these five different vectors, is it getting better, worse, or the same? Well, we have more adversaries than ever and more types of adversaries and new types of adversaries. So that's not getting better. Technology, we had to adapt the x86 virtualization, cloud computing, mobility, bring your own device. That's not getting easier. Uh, compliance, yeah, PCI made everyone's job easier, right? HIPAA, high tech. You know, these things, on none of these fronts are things getting easier. None of them. So you know, are you growing and are you maturing at the same rate that each of these are evolving? And usually the answer is no. If you're a practitioner, um, so the people who are demographically drawn to do security are risk averse. We hate change. Look at the headline there. Every single one of those is change. So we're not well suited to deal with change. And that's one of the reasons we struggle. But uh, you know, the, Gene did use this slide. Um, Jack Daniel, Stacey Thayer, myself, Casey Yarrett, and the uh, gal sponsor, we did the industry's first Maslock stress index thing is an independent stress index survey. And basically what we found out is we have incredibly dangerous levels of burnout and fatigue in the industry. 
the top three measures of, uh, there's Gene right there. The top three measures that this, in, this checks for you know, firemen, policemen, soldiers, et cetera, is uh, three things. Um, your level of fatigue, your level of cynicism, and your perceived self-efficacy. I hate that last one, but perceived self-efficacy. Do you think you're doing a good job? Not are you doing a good job, but do you think you are? And although the sample set was not huge, and although we mostly talked to InfoSec people, um, we were off the charts on uh, fatigue. We were off the charts on cynicism, literally the, the highest score. So cynicism is our core competence. Um, and and we, we were on the borderline for um, uh, self-efficacy, but what happens is people think they're doing a good job because they pass the audit, and when they get breached anyhow, they hit the ground harder. Um, but it was very interesting. We had a guy who was a SWAT team, uh, team lead. He would kick in doors for the DEA. I think it was actually here in Texas. And he got into InfoSec five years ago, and he said he's twice as stressed in InfoSec as he ever was. And it blew our mind. We're like, he has to be making this up. But he had very clear answers as to why. Now, the, the, the difference here, and I've probably spent too much time on the burnout slide here. The difference here is in all those industries like EMTs and policemen, they have support networks. They have early ways to identify risk. They have ways to give you time off or give you counseling. And we have none of those such things. So we're really going to try to pay attention to this. But I think if you watch Gene Kim's talk, I mean, we are sometimes doomed to failure. We're in a death spiral. And, and that does lead to stress. And we take that home to our loved ones. You know, we take that in, into our health. Um, so I'd like to break that cycle. I think we can. So there's some more information on us at secburnout.org and itburnout.org. Now, I'm going to talk for a second here about why it matters. We did this rugged summit uh, where we locked 10 of us in a hotel for a week. Um, and one of the things that was accidental is you watched the, one of the early TED Talks by Simon Sinek. I gave you a link here at the bottom. But he has the golden circle, right? And it, it was really, it kind of changed the tone of the conversation. What he's basically saying is every single company can tell you what they do. Every single one of them. Some of them can tell you how they do it. But very, very, very few articulate why they do it, or if it matters, or what their values are. And he has a very compelling argument as to why it's so much more important to focus on values first, or why first, or context first. And that's the difference maker. You know, I think one of the things that punctuated it for me is he said Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a plan. He said, I have a dream, right? So um, it's, it's really an interesting thing. So at least for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to focus on why I think security matters, and specifically why application security matters. Um, one of the things I did before I saw that Simon Sinek video is this is usually my first, my first slide in every talk. I, I know people think in terms of breaches as frequency and impact, or probability and impact. But I wanted to put a sideways look at it and say, how replaceable is something? Nearly everyone's had a credit card breached whether it was your fault, your bank, or a merchant, whatever, nearly all of you. It's really simple to replace. At most, it's a $50 fine, maybe an inconvenience for your direct billing. It doesn't really hurt. And we spend 95% of our time and energy protecting random credit cards for the banks, instead of at the opportunity cost and neglect of really serious things that are less replaceable, things like intellectual property and trade secrets. I mean, the hemorrhage of intellectual property from the US right now is disgusting. And I know Fortune 100 companies who don't spend a penny protecting trade secrets. They only solve for the auditor. We fear the auditor more than the attacker, because they might, you know, I might get hacked, but I will be fine. And it's left us incredibly prone. And when you start looking at things like hacking insulin pumps or infrastructure attacks, uh, it starts getting serious. So I'm trying to push some of the focus away from the far right, which matters very little, towards things that matter a lot. You know, when I was dealing with viruses, the biggest impact was to your IT. It was like your CPU cycles or your network bandwidth. That was the impact of an attack. Then it went to fungible assets like money. Uh, intellectual property and trade secrets is this espionage and kitten killing APT nonsense. And then uh, you know, the reason I started researching Anonymous is I saw you know, this is a reaction to increased surveillance and censorship. So if this doesn't go well, if there becomes like an escalation there, you know, I should pay attention to what my kids' rights are and if we still have a free and open internet and things like that. And obviously, safety in human life. Now, one of my idols is the guy with the most sexy uh, mutton chops in the world is Dan Gear, And he often talks in terms of security as a factor of dependence, like how dependent you are on something. Um, his greatest story for that is that he was working at a hospital. Uh, your, I think it was one of the Harvard uh, medical centers. And er they had a power outage. And every single doctor under a certain age was incapable of doing their job. And every doctor over a certain age saw it as no issue whatsoever. And it was because we became too dependent upon that IT. So I'm going to tell you my single best measure for knowing that we're not getting better 
is that our dependence upon software is growing at a rate faster than our ability to secure it. It's that simple, guys. So we're putting software in power structures. We're putting things directly exposed to the internet. We have Smart Grid. We have SCADA. We have, if you do a Shodan search right now, if you don't know what Shodan is, go and take a look. If you do a search right now from your phone on PLC, directly connected to the internet with default passwords, you will find boiler rooms in churches in the UK that you could blow up with a push of a button. I mean, almost that simple. We put Microsoft operating systems in our cars. We make them Bluetooth enabled, okay? We're putting uh, insulin, ha you know, we have Bluetooth in our insulin pumps. You can give a lethal dose of insulin. You know, I, I'm trying to remember which different researchers did this, but they keep weaponizing this and making it scarier sounding. But even several years ago, MIT did a proof of concept hardware-based root kit on pacemakers. So this is not trying to be FUD. I hate FUD. I fight FUD tooth and nail, but you know, this is the stuff I want us to get our, our act together on. I, in some ways, on some days, I don't give a crap that we aren't doing a good job protecting a web server. I give a crap that we're increasingly allowing the rest of the world to blindly and ignorantly put software in places it doesn't belong, putting more consequential uh, outcomes at risk. So just as a thought experiment, I'm not the first to say it, but I'm going to put it very, very simply. Just for the next 24 hours, every time you see the word software, if you have, if you have a grease monkey script, just do this. Every time you see the word software, I want you to think about vulnerability, such that if you have a toaster with no software, and you add software to it, you now have a much scarier toaster. I also want you to substitute connected or networked with exposed, such that if you have a network connected uh, toaster with software, it's, it's even worse, or that car that we were talking about. And I'm not trying to spread FUD, but we have people increasingly putting software in places it doesn't belong. Um, and I want to decrease our dependence and our exposure uh, rather than assume we're going to magically already, always write perfect code. So I don't think our challenges are technical at all. Uh, I was just at Black Hat again. I'm so sick of going to Black Hat. I love Black Hat in some ways, but it's a whole bunch of zero days with no business context, and there's absolutely no idea if it's going to impact anybody. In fact, if you think about the highest profile, most scandalous talks from a couple years ago, they never, ever came to pass. They didn't matter at all. And it's basically a conference of what without why. And um, I think while we have technical challenges, what dawned on me is that our bigger challenges are incentives and cultures. How do we get people to do this? So I'm going to say this as respectfully as I can, because I do have tremendous respect for OWASP. Screw the OWASP top 10. I just want to see an OWASP top 1. We haven't earned the credibility of the rest of the organization that we can find a simple thing, fix a simple thing, start small, prove our value. You know, I want to eliminate SQL this year. I mean, we know how, right? Is there anybody here who doesn't have a technical way to eliminate SQL? We haven't really sold the business, convinced them, and given them value. So, you know, we will fight about this in the hallway over lunch, and I intend to, but it's really more to provoke a conversation. Uh, in general, we confuse activity. We put activity over effect. You know, we're trying, but I want to see some results, right? We tend to look at symptoms instead of root causes. Do you really want to find 400 instantiations of SQL injection, or do you want to get to the, the methodologies and the platforms and the choices that lead to those? Uh, we choose the easy problems over the important ones. I also am not a fool. Of course, I believe in the Pareto principles, but I have a default allergy to the 80-20 rule. Because I don't think we're spending uh, 80, uh, I think we're spending 80 percent of our time on a 20 percent solution. It's not magic. Just because you invoke the term Pareto principle doesn't mean you're actually gotten your choices right. So I don't think I best, basically anytime I hear best practices, I assume they aren't. Um, anytime I hear good enough, I know it isn't. Um, things have changed so much, and yet our our notions of best practices come from the 2003 era adversary and 2003 era uh, IT landscape, and so much has changed except for us. So again, it goes to incentives. So what do you do about it? I'm not going to just weep in gnashing of teeth, right? What do we do about this? Well, for some people, they'd rather you have plausible deniability than actually get better at it. So you have to, on a personal level, decide, is your job to be able to say why something failed, or is your job to try to make it better? I'm going to choose that maybe two of you in the room, at least, uh, want to get better. And I'm going to show you ways I've tried to passionately seek ways to get better. So one of the problems is if you're always looking where everyone else has, you're not going to find anything new. So you kind of have to look in the dark corners of the map. And sometimes there's dragons there. Um, I'm not saying this is one of the dragons, although I have been bit. Um,
But one of the things that was interesting when you look at things like Anonymous is I think whether you love them or hate them, they did the industry a tremendous service over the last two years. That summer of lulls, the 50-day rampage where they basically attacked anyone and everyone, they held a mirror to our neglect. They showed how poorly the industry has operationalized basic web hygiene. They essentially had three tricks, right? SQL injection, network layer DDoS, and phishing. Now, there was a couple that had more talent than that or, or more use cases than that. Every time they tried it, it worked, right? We know how to stop DDoS. My company stops DDoS all the time. We know how to stop SQL injection. And yet, look how bad a job these huge companies did at operationalizing those basics. So to me, that's an opportunity to finally have board level attention and start a dialogue on, you know, why were we falling down? Well, you know, some of these companies that got breached, the, the first th thing the board asked is why did we get breached? Were PCI compliant? And, and the answer number one was, well, PCI is literally the least we could do. It wasn't going to be security. It was the least we could do to pass. And second of all, the servers that got attacked weren't even PCI scoped. So we didn't do anything on those servers. So it was a nice wake-up call and reminder that there's more assets than just the ones the auditor is looking at. Now, I also coined HD Moore's Law. I don't think I'm going to have time to get into it too much here. But essentially, you know, I can't tell you when you've done enough security. But I can tell you when you haven't. And what I basically asserted is, just like Moore's Law is that compute power doubles every 18 to 24 months, the strength of a script kitty or a casual adversary grows at the rate of Metasploit. So H.D. Moore uh, invented Metasploit, local guy. Um, he, this is a free open source project. It's the single largest Ruby project in the world, if I recall. Um, every single day, talented folks like you add new evasions, new payloads, new modules. You got people uh, making tools for collaboration like Armitage. I mean, you've got all these people making it stronger every single day. Which means someone with zero talent gets better at attacking every single day. And if you follow that green line, I'm saying an attacker's success rate is 100% when you do zero security. And it stays 100% until you can exhaust their attack capacity. So H.G. Moore's law, essentially in a nutshell, you can read the blog post later, says you need to be this tall to ride the internet. The sad truth is, almost everyone that's tried this has found they are not tall enough. Right? So the first time they tested their hypothesis, they found they couldn't do it. So go ahead and pass your PCI audit. That, that purple line is the auditor. You can make them go away really easily. But the bad news is the weakest attackers we have, the ones that actually lead to breaches, are stronger than you are. So to me, this creates that missing feedback loop that allows you to know perpetually at any given time, are we at least stopping our weakest adversaries? Now, I also do research with some collaborators. And in my day job, I do a lot of intelligence work. And the other thing the industry is bad at is we tend to say, let's Fix all of, and fix and harden and secure every asset, and that way it doesn't matter who's attacking us. And I think we have our attack surface approaching infinity. We're losing sphere of control. So I'm flipping things on its head, and I'm saying you should first know who's attacking you, then you know why they're doing it, which assets they tend to go after, and which methodologies and TTPs or tactics and needs procedures. And this is a good focusing exercise as well. But let me get to the uh, rugged stuff. So Gene showed you some of this. We, one of my favorite collaborators on this, I mean, he really brought a passion for DevOps. We saw a natural harmony with the initial rugged stuff, which I've yet to define for you. Um, but this is also a terrifying and an amazing opportunity uh, for us to maybe change things and change the way we've been engaging business. So I'm going to give you the pyramid, the magic pyramid. So Cynic has a magic circle. I'm going to slowly go through. We usually do this too quickly. I like zombies. I like to kill zombies, mostly in video games. But I also like to kill dogmatic ideas. Um, so here's the zombie survival pyramid. If you were running through the field and being chased by hordes of the undead who want to eat your brains, which of those two are you going to pick to hide in? Anybody? I mean, we need to pick defensible infrastructure. So this is my recipe on what the empty calories are. My wife's a dietitian, so she likes you know, the food guide pyramid. I'm asserting that lower levels of the pyramid are foundational and have the highest dividends for securing an environment operationally. So the most important choice is how defensible is your infrastructure. That could be a cloud. That could be an, uh, a mobile OS. Is iOS more defensible than Android? I think there's quantifiable ways to say yes, it is. So choosing defensible infrastructure is the single most important thing that's going to help determine your survival. You may have IT choices made by others in the past or in the future that cannot be defended, no matter how much heroism you put into it. The second most important thing, which I used to make fun of, and now I apologize every time I can get a chance, is the Gene Kim visible ops philosophy. This is operational excellence. This isn't security either. 
This is the idea of know what you have, know when it changes, zero, a tolerance of zero unplanned changes. This is keeping your wits about you in the zombie apocalypse. Do people know their roles? Do people keep their sanity? You know, sometimes your fellow survivors will get, in, get you killed, so you get rid of them, right? But uh, if the bottom is about reducing your attack surface, then this is about reducing your chaos and entropy. That's Gene Kim right there. Isn't he, isn't he smiley? Okay. Um, then, then comes situational awareness, right? This also isn't really security what starts dabbling into it. This is the idea that if you're being attacked, uh, do you have floodlights? Do you have door sensors? Do you know how many are attacking you? From which direction? Do you know if they're zombies which need you know, to get hit in the head or if they're vampires which need a wooden stake or if they're werewolves which need a silver bullet? So we fight blindly and we die quickly. We are incredibly poorly instrumented. You know, rugged code is well instrumented code, right? So we don't have sufficient instrumentation throughout the layers of our stack. And this is the ooh in OODA loop, right? Observe, orient, decide, act. And often we're just reacting blindly. So this is much better use. Uh, better detection faster uh, leads to faster reaction. And then last comes the countermeasure. These really are the empty calories, right? Once you know that you have a defensible infrastructure, you're managing it well, you know who's attacking from which direction, what they're attacking, then you can have specific countermeasures. And yet, look at what things like PCI do. We start at the top, we buy the product that some product vendor told us or scared us into buying, and that's what we do. And no wonder we're losing. So the bigger dividends come down the pyramid. Now, the good news is all this push towards security intelligence, all this push towards um, OODA loops, um, you're starting to see that in the conference circuit, right? So people are starting to realize we have to push down the pyramid. I'm going to try to save you five years and suggest that any way you can influence or affect change with your CIO and CTO at the bottom, any way you can improve a business process by reading visible ops or getting better uh, rigor in your process or doing CMDBs or doing puppet and chef and embracing some of the, the opportunities DevOps gives you to do uh, better automation and process control, these things were always going to give you a better outcome. All right, but mostly I'm not saying that's the way. There are many ways forward. What I think is, if I look back at the various things my, my collaborators have tried, myself have tried, it's, it's an attitude of experimentation, right? All we've done is we had a single theory of do these 12 PCI things and we'll be safe, but a, an untested theory or a hypothesis is called a wish, right? And what I really like about the H.D. Moore's Law, what I really like about the pyramid is you can keep trying until you're tall enough. And the funny thing is, the people who tried to get tall enough for something like H.D. Moore's Law, they realized more tools wasn't going to get them there, more headcount wasn't going to get them there. What got them there was this prioritized approach, right? Having less things to defend, running them better, noticing changes more soon, okay? So hopefully I've made a good assertion there with that rubric, but we can talk about it. So let's get to rugged software. Because I, we have lots of fights about this in OAS, which perplexes me. But, um, San Francisco is special to Rugged in a couple different ways. One is the first time I met Jeff Williams was at uh, the RSA conference. And I had to look at him like this because he's way too tall. And I still give him crap every time that he's still too tall. But um, I didn't know the guy at all. And I said, with all respect, you know, congratulations on OWASP, but we're making all the same mistakes that we did with operating system vulnerabilities, right? Where you have scanners to enumerate them. You know, we're going to have patches for them, except for now we're doing it for a couple of us we're going to do this, blah, blah, blah. And I was saying it with love in my heart. Um, but we were talking about why is it that we haven't made bigger gains. And David Rice was also there. He wrote Geekonomics, and he was a friend from some other uh, contexts for the IONS things I do with CISOs, the roundtables. And what we realized is we looked up the Agile Manifesto, and we saw that the word risk didn't show up, the words the security didn't show up, the words threat didn't show up. And it's OK. It's not, you know. It was not a security movement, but it was changing the way secure, uh, development worked. So we said, as a response, how do we get people to value security? Because they don't. They hate security. Security is a ruined, toxic word. The other reasons I think San Francisco is nice is because that's where David Rice and I uh, did debut this publicly about a year and a half later. And then also, if you think about how you build buildings in San Francisco, they have this pesky problem called earthquakes, right? So if you build a skyscraper here, you just build a skyscraper, if I understand, right? But if you build one there, you have to factor for the environmental reality of earthquakes. And one of the things David says in his intro of his book, which is profound, is steel and concrete are foundational to society. Not a single one of you sat in perpetual fear that this building was going to collapse upon you. None of you. You just take it for granted. But his assertion is we're becoming as dependent on software as we are 
on steel and concrete, and it's nowhere nearly as reliable, and we wanted to change that. So if it took us 25 years for this dialogue, and lots of getting beat up by different OWASP people and personalities, that's fine. We knew we had to start the conversation and change the culture towards rugged and defensible infrastructure. So my primary complaint when uh, beating up Jeff was I said, we keep fighting the heads of the hydro. We never go for the heart. I don't want to find and fix all the bugs. I want to stop the industrial vulnerability complex that's churning them out. So if we can't get to the 99.999% of the developers that were producing this, then we were never going to shut off the, uh, the flood. So these are just a couple of snippets from that original presentation. Software not just has to be fast, not just agile. Remember, we want to be agile but not fragile. But are you also rugged, right? We wanted to add that to the mix. And rugged doesn't mean perfect, right? It just means that you're, you're tested and you're capable and you're ready for it. So we do face harsh climates. We do have unfriendly, talented, motivated adversaries. So we wrote a manifesto of our own. Um, and it's a little cheesy, but I'm actually going to read it to you because um, I haven't read it in a long, long time. So it's 10 lines. It says, I am rugged, and more importantly, my code is rugged. I recognize that software has become a foundation of our modern world. I recognize the awesome responsibility that comes with this foundational role. This is my favorite line. I recognize my code will be used in ways I cannot anticipate, in ways it was not designed, and for longer than it was ever intended. Does that sound familiar? I recognize my code will be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries who threaten our physical, economic, and national security. I recognize these things, and I choose to be rugged. I'm rugged because I refuse to be a source of vulnerability or weakness. I'm rugged because I assure my code will support its mission. I'm rugged because my code can face these challenges and persist in spite of them. I am rugged not because it is easy, but because it is necessary, and I am up for the challenge. So that was our emotional response to the Agile Manifest. I really think you could boil it down to this single line, right? It's, it's reality. It rings true. So the question and the plea was, are you rugged? And this is, uh, even if this, at my most cynical moment, even if this is a slight or a finesse away from the toxic word security, it's still powerful. Um, we did put out the ruggedsoftware.org site. We have now added lots of documents. We've seen massive adoption in places like uh, DHS. There's a whole software assurance movement and investment, and there's a collaboration with MITRE, and they really weren't getting much traction using the word assurance. They thought that was the way to fix security. For some reason, where the word security fails, the word rugged works. I don't know why. This is my most cynical moment. There's a whole magazine in Crosstalk, which is for the defense and infrastructure, uh, dedicated to rugged, uh, and shows a bunch of experimentation from academia. Um, but really, when I noticed that developers and OWASP people hated the term, what I found is CIOs love the term. <laughs> When I found that you know, ask, you know, uh, AppSec vendors hated the term, I found certain developers actually loved it. Um, a couple weeks after we debuted it, and I got kicked in the teeth pretty hard by some OWASP people. Um, I was about to like say, "Screw this! I'm too busy. I have my day job. I'm going to focus on the things I do for a living." And we, I was visiting a friend at an airline, and the coffee maker on his floor didn't work, so we had to go down to a different floor. And we're walking past a cubicle, and there was a full poster size print out of the Rugged Manifesto. I'm like, that's awesome. I'm like, does he work for you? He goes, this isn't a security floor. It was just a developer who had found it, and it kind of spoke to him. And if we can reach one or two at a time, we can get this into some undergraduate programs, some postgrad programs. If we can get someone to add a single day guest lecture into some development course, that was a good idea. But the thing that I found from all these people who didn't hate it was security is dead. Security is a dirty word. People hate security. The only people who love security are in this room, okay? Why do they hate it? They hate it because it's a cost that comes out of the things they want to spend money on. They don't see this as valuable. There's no ROI in security. It is a cost. It is a tax. It is an undesired one. And it's an inhibitor. They want to bring iPads to work, and we say no. They want to go into Amazon to save money, and we say no. So we can't be a cost and inhibitor, even if that's the reality of the matter. So guess what? I can keep using a word that's useless and dead, or you can take the Pepsi challenge, and whenever you would have talked to a, uh, a CIO and used the word security, say rugged. So is this rhetoric? No. Uh, I'm hoping she's in the room. I don't see her. But one of my early adopters was the CISO, CISO of the Texas Education Agency. 
Uh, she tried to get an AppSec uh, proposal through two years in a row, and it failed every time. Uh, she saw this and we talked about it, so she simply took the CIO's priorities for the year, which were these words, except she did, it didn't have security on there, and she slid the word security in and she called it the rugged Texas Education Agency proposal. She used his words, his language, didn't call it security, slid the security budget in there, and he said yes to something he said no to two prior years. Now, I'm being cynical here. So I know this is attributed to uh, Wicket, who is also brilliant and also uses these words, but these actually came from Wendy Nather. Um, and this proposal got through. So she got her training, she got her scanning tools, she got things through because it was slightly different in tone from a negative to something that the, the CIO wanted. Here's another success story who I had to remove his, I'll, hit, I'll let me use his name, but this is uh, Gorlich. Uh, Gorlick, excuse me, he gave a talk at uh, B-Sides Detroit, and he is in a financial vertical. Um, he basically went hook, line, and sinker for Rugged immediately, and for, Rugged, and for DevOps as soon as we had Rugged DevOps. Uh, his tangible successes you can read on your own, but he basically said, and I'm gonna read this from the show notes here, um, it was more tonal than anything. He said, the term Rugged changed the conversation with my developers and architects from that's security's job to that's my job, right? It made it more personal. It turned it into more like a quality thing or a safety thing where safety is everyone's responsibility. So he also was fighting the tides and he changed the conversation by making it look like this was everybody's responsibility and we had a common plan for doing so. Now, by the way, this predates the Rugged Summit. This predates the Rugged Handbook and the Implementation Guide. This was someone who latched onto the value set and found a way to experiment and drive value. Uh, I just met this guy yesterday. I'm not even sure it's gonna work, but this uh, cab forward site read our rugged uh, um, handbook that we published earlier this year. Uh, made a cab forward slash security on their commitment and their attestation to what they're going to do for their customers in the area of security. So I can't tell you if this is a fairy tale or if this is like exactly what they do and that's gonna be up to them to d decide and deliver. But it's interesting and valuable that they can see this as a way to differentiate their IT offerings, their development offerings by showing how seriously they're at least admitting they acknowledge the existence of security concerns and have uh, at least publicly committed to doing something about it. I can't give you a testimonial for them, and they're not the only ones. There's a lot of Texas-based companies. I find Texas is probably the most rugged state. Um, there's Firehost, which is like a rack space, but they do more to secure it. There's things like the Denim Group, who doesn't just do outsource uh, coding, they do outsource secure coding, right? So there are people here. Then there's this guy who's helping to run this conference, uh, especially this track, uh, Wicket. He spells it differently, but if you're as old as I am, you know what Gauntlet is. Um, but he also made making excuses. It's funny, you know, I had all these like salty dogs in AppSec uh, making fun of us and he started implementing it in his day job. And then when DevOps came out, he just started doing it. And when people were talking about, man, we really need some free tools like Chaos Monkey for security, he starts writing one with Netflix through the Gauntlet platform. So we have people who make excuses and we have people who make progress. Um, it, it also dawned on me that the ruggedness is more of an attitude, a very positive attitude of wanting to try things and get better uh, than it really was a methodology. So it, it, at its most humble, it's a declaration of intent and an acknowledgement or recognition of the threat landscape. Rugged Summit, really briefly. Um, we really needed this, we desperately needed this, and I can't reveal who the benefactor was, but we had a, a, an agency fund bringing several of us together, locking us in a hotel for a week uh, to fight and do some work. Not to just talk, but we did a working week. Um, it was, uh, some of the participants include Jeff Williams, myself, uh, Gene Kim, we had development people like uh, John Vlander. we had really uh, seasoned AppSec people and, and pillars in the government area like uh, uh, Van Wick. Um, and we fought, and we fought. We even had old school hackers, Chris Weissopel join. Um, we fought, and we fought, and we fought, and we argued, and we said, how can we get better? How can we change the conversation? How do we take the existing body of work from things like OWASP, or BSIM, or OSAM, or different cults, or whatever you want to pick? How do we get better? How do we move the needle? And I'd love to tell you we sang Kumbaya, but we fought it a lot. In fact, uh, we don't even all agree on all the content in the Rugged Manual. That's why it's a straw man. That's why we want you to beat the crap out of it. 
There's some really good stuff in there. There's some less good stuff in there. There's stuff that we talked about we still have to add. Um, but what we realized in doing this is when you had incredibly committed people with incredibly different experiences and we couldn't come to consensus, it humbled us to know how big an issue this is. And it didn't break my resolve, it strengthened it. It told me that this needs more conversation and more contributors, not less. Because this is, there's a reason we haven't gotten much better, guys. It's because it's really hard. Um, but I know it's worth it, and I'm tough enough to keep doing it. So the straw man, right? Um, I added my own little caption. Dorothy, why do some AppSec gurus hate rugged? <laughs> um, haters are going to hate, right? Um, I think one of the more interesting things, besides the fact that we all sat around the campfire, is the notion of a story. So if you haven't read the, I'm not going to read the entire document to you. I encourage you to read it and beat it up. Um, Matt Conda read it in like two hours and gave us pages and pages of great feedback. Um, but the idea of a story is an interesting game changer from what we do. Again, we have a lot of technical solutions. This is not a technical approach. This is a cultural and business uh, and boundary spanning approach. So what is a story? So this is just a mock-up. Um, a story is this unifying concept that takes you from the CIO to the CTO to the architect to the security people to the developers to the QA to your public attestation if you want to on the website as to how seriously you take the security concerns of your customer. So for example, if this is a bank, you have it be making attestations, what you do for infrastructure control, application control, data protection, rugged development, life cycles, security ver verification, you know, how you test yourself, how you prove it. And these stories can be weak fairy tales through really hardcore manifestos um, about the priorities and the decisions that you make. And we found several great examples of this. Um, Box.net has one. We don't know if they're great programs. We found great examples that already existed. Apple has some on privacy and some other things. You know, my own employer, Akamai, the, the, the approach that I talked about in that pyramid, I developed that pyramid before I got to Akamai. I got there and I found out that most of those good trade-off decisions have been in place for the entirety of the Akamai platform. So there's really good proof points in the industry of how people are doing this intelligently and how they're articulating how seriously they take security and privacy. And uh, we're trying to have, instead of enumerating badness, this is a chance to enumerate some goodness, to do some positive attestation. Now, the other thing about the story, well, I'm skipping something, I guess. But um, Gene did this in a matter of five minutes. And he did this massive interdependency map of all the different stakeholders in an organization. And we looked at where there was natural enemies and natural affinities. Those little orange things, which I'll let you ogle at on your own time, represented really big gaps, really big areas that were preventing us from moving forward. So we flagged potential things. Like one of them is, what's this, the buyer's bill of rights? So how do you get a CIO to feel more entitled from his software supply chain or her software supply chain to have code that doesn't suck, that doesn't push costs onto them, that, doesn't, that is patchable, that gets patches in a timely manner, things like that. Uh, T's and C's, money back guarantees, uh, you know, commitments like some of the states are doing. So we realized that this isn't just a developer problem. This is a, uh, an entire organization's problem. And putting the burden on the developers in the AppSec community, you know, that's like the, the tail wagging the dog. So anyhow, um, back to that story. We then realized and we wrote sections for rugged by role. So the CIO's job is to communicate to the business that these three, if we're a bank, these three top level concerns could affect our bottom line and our customers. So they might say fraud is an issue, for example. That downstream passes to security analysts who then enumerate all the ways in which that fraud can be uh, perpetrated. And then the architects make decisions on, OK, so which libraries and which development environments and which um, um, SDLs should we put in place? And the developers then execute. And all these things map line of sight, direct linear linkage to some business goal. That way you're not scanning for a bunch of stuff you found and trying to convince the CIO if it matters. The CIO told you what mattered. And you can drive linkage. So even if this is a simple way to organize your choices about which apps to scan and, and which ones do you get fixed and according to which business driver. And when the time you're all done, everybody knows their role and why they're doing it, you have a nice big tree. And at the end, you can turn that into a public attestation. So this is the ugliest version I could muster this morning. I still want to find a better way to do this. But if the CIO has three concerns, that might map to, you know, each one of them might map to several different architectural choices, which could map to developer requirements, which could map to QA. It's kind of sick to think about putting the onus on those lazy developers just getting smarter, because why should they fix a whole bunch of instantiations of code if they could have made an upstream decision on some IT choice that would obviate that? 
Because when you start enumerating this, every single one of those becomes a work stream, which has a cost, which has a head count. So back to that pyramid, one of the best ways to be defensible in the zombie apocalypse is have fewer things to protect and have more protectable things. So it starts driving more visibility into, OK, you know what? Maybe every time we, we scan a PHP script in our environment, we find bugs. Maybe we should stop doing new PHP things. I'm not saying you can't make secure things in PHP, but if you have a high correlation, then you start making a business decision that all new applications will be in this environment on this platform. All right, so things we did not put in the manual or in the implementation guide, but we did discuss and create bodies of work and have great screenshots and, and scrap notes are how do you get CIOs to give them guides on buying uh, so, and, and identifying and rewarding, you know, are there RFP questions? Are there terms and conditions uh, templates for contract language? I'm not going to read all these to you, but these were things that we worked on that we have room to add in. But let me just really, really simplify. For you, pick one of these four quadrants to start. I'm going to assert to you, I think I said this to you yesterday, if you think about a simple, simple, simple quadrant, on the first column, there's stuff that already exists. It's sunk cost. It's old. It's legacy. And on the new things, there are things that have yet to be written, yet to be purchased, right? The future. One of the things I tried to assert to the summit is let's just completely give up on the past. Let's create a methodology to identify, build, and set better code decisions going forward because I would assert it's much, much easier to do new stuff than to do old stuff. So move forward, then move backward. The second thing we said is just the stuff you buy and there's the stuff you build. And one of my biggest successes in an insurance company was my guy couldn't get an AppSec program funded. So we went to his CIO and we said that you deserve better code and your, your vendors are passing their costs on to you. So year one of our project, if you had a long view on this, was getting the CIO to demand better security from his supply chain. And guess what? When he got a taste for valuing good security from bad security, next year they said, you know what? 60% of our code is ours. Can we also do that for our code? And he said yes, right? So this, again, is not a technical solution. It's a cultural thing. So I've chosen in my efforts to focus on new forward development, like, like DevOps, and to focus on new projects versus old ones. And usually, if you have an obstinate CIO, you start with getting them to feel that they deserve better from their purchasing, because it's much, much harder to build internally. And again, try things, experiment. I had this slide once, so I put it in a second time, because experimentation is so necessary. At the end of the day, though, if I'm really honest with myself, I think Rugged is more than anything, just like the, the Chaos Monkey from Netflix with an attitude of the only way to avoid failure is to fail all the time, to want to fail. I think I want to be tested. I want to prove it. I want to be successful. So I, I think rugged is an attitude, much like the honey badger don't care. I'd love to get a point where I don't care who's attacking me. I can handle it. Bring it, right? Not that I'm going to win every fight. You know how many prize fighters win every fight? How many UFC fighters win every fight? But you're willing to get in a fight, and you're willing to do it. Now, I'd like to say honey badger don't care, but I think I care a little too much. So that's the shirt I bought for myself and Wendy. But you know. I'm not sure that this is perfect, but we're rugged enough to take your assaults and your criticisms and whatnot. But I'd rather have your cooperation and your collaboration. So if you don't like what you've heard or you like parts of it, work with us. Make it better. I'd like to thank my collaborators and my fellow journeymen on this. This is how you can reach me, uh, my blog, and also the rugged accounts. And I, I thank you for your time. I'm really pleased and thankful to, to the AppSec group for giving us an entire rugged DevOps track. And hopefully, we're starting a good dialogue. But uh, thank you. I think I have one minute for questions, then we go eat. Or we just go eat. OK. <laughs>